Well, the word again today, obedience. Obedience pays off, doesn't it? Or does it? That's what we're going to talk about today. We are on our last leap in the book of Joshua. We're going to finish it up today, which if you look to see how much is left is a lot. But you're going to get the Pastor Donna condensed version of what happened between where we left off last week and where the book finishes up. You remember last week we talked about the mighty fortress of Jericho, that stronghold that was out in the middle of the desert that the spies had gone in and checked out to figure out they met Rahab the prostitute who gave them some inside secrets on how to get in and ultimately how it helped to destroy the temple at Jericho, the whole town, the city of Jericho. And just as God promised the Israelites were protected again and again. Do you notice that theme through the whole thing? That no matter what happened, the Israelites were protected over and over and over again. From those first days out of exile, Becky talked about it this morning, over in Egypt, they followed Moses around for 40 excruciating long years And they wandered around this desert wasteland going from 10,000 foot elevation down to sea level and everywhere in between, waiting for God's signal to cross over to the promised land, the land of milk and honey, the place of perfection that God had prepared and promised to them. But something happened in the interim because old Moses died. Now what were they going to do? But as God is, God had a plan. And he had Joshua in the wings. And Joshua never hesitated one moment. He stepped right in. He never said, why me? I'm not capable. You've got the wrong person. He just stepped right in and said, yep, God, if you call me to it, I'm taking the green light. I'm going to go right on and fill in those shoes of Moses. And as we've learned that Joshua was this incredible, brilliant strategist, he was an outstanding leader, but more importantly, above anything at all, he was a devoted man of God. He spent an incredible amount of time praying and listening. I love Becky's example today, red light, yellow light, green light. Joshua knew when to stop, he knew when to take it easy, slow down, and he knew when to go because he was a man of God. So after that miracle crossing over the Jordan River, remember that when when God stopped the river on both ends, they carried the Ark of the Covenant out to the middle, and all of those Israelites that we figure had to take even days for them to all cross the river, they finally crossed. It was all during flood stage to boot when there was that much more water to deal with, but that's how awesome God is. And it was during flood stage when God chose this time for the passage because the land was filled with bounty above and beyond anything that you can imagine. But it also made the crossing more difficult unless God was in your corner. And so as they were getting ready to cross, Joshua said, we need to stop. Red light. We need to take time to praise God and thank God as we acclimate ourselves and prepare ourselves to enter this land that he has promised. But trouble was brewing. As is always when change is going on, um, and and in that period of time, there was always someone looking to push someone out and conquer someone, whatever. It's just a reminder of how quickly we forget to count our blessings. We just often take our blessings for granted every day, don't we? We go through a day and nothing goes wrong, and we often don't say, thank you, Jesus, for that. We just take it for granted. But boy, oh boy, when we have a day that is fraught with one thing after the other, we realize that we haven't always counted our blessings. 
God had been clear to the Israelites that they were under no circumstances to, when they went into battle anywhere, and they knew that there would be battle ahead because they were entering countries where there were other kings, but this was God's promised land. And God had said to them through Joshua, don't steal, don't plunder, don't take anything. I'm going to give you specific instructions for each place that you're going into. But the number one thing is don't steal and plunder. Keep your hands off of stuff that is not yours. Well, how does one control some 20, 30,000 Israelite soldiers? Greed took over, and in fact, some of them did plunder, and the Israelites, not in general, but a, a group of them developed kind of this entitlement mentality. Well, if we're going to go into this country or that country, then we can take whatever we want because it's going to be ours anyway because God promised it. Uh-oh. God doesn't take kindly to that sort of thing. And so the stage was set for wars, and wars there were, one right after the other. Chapters 7 through 12 in the book of Joshua describes in details the fights with the local kings and the colonies, and yet God remained faithful to the Israelites. Did some of them die? Yes. But many more of the kings and colonies died because God was leading them through that promised land that he had promised 40 years before. In a couple of those battles, God saw fit to put several of the local tribes under Joshua's charge. Instead of having them killed and, and taken out of where they're at, God said, Joshua, I want you to take these people and I want you to train them to be your own as part of the Israelite army. And so that's what Joshua did, treated them well. They became faithful and really became much like the Israelite people, but they still kept their own identities of the land that they were from. At last, finally, the division of the lands ensued, and there was more bounty than anyone could have ever imagined. A city of refuge was even created because along the way when you're battling and fighting and unexpected things happen, sometimes there were people that were killed accidentally. Israelite soldiers had accidentally killed people. Some of these new tribes that had been brought in with the Israelites had not intentionally killed and plundered people, but it happened in the chaos of battle. And so a refuge city was created for people that would be rejected by general society. They could come into this refuge city, go through a process, and stay there and be safe. They were people who really had been wrongly accused and they didn't have anywhere else to go. They were considered equal and they were provided for and given provision and most of all, given love. So what do we learn from all this? This is the fourth week that we've been talking about Joshua and the walk around the desert and Moses' death and all the details of that. What do we learn from all this? It's quite simple, and right there it is. Obedience pays off. Was it paying off for Joshua? Well, look around at where he was and what was going on. His faithful obedience to God brought the Israelites more than they could have ever imagined. So it begs us to ask ourselves, has obedience ever paid off in your life, in our lives? Now you guys know that Mike and I are pretty avid football fans, so we're like on overload here on Thanksgiving weekend. But one of the things that struck me watching either bits and pieces of games or whole games yesterday and the day before was that you've got those young men have got to be obedient to what they're told to do. What would happen if you don't even know anything about football? It's irrelevant. 
But what would happen if these young men would go out on the field and the coaches had said, do this, don't do that, do this, play, and give them, and they looked at each other and said, nah, we're going to do what we want to do anyway. It'd be complete chaos, right? You can't do that. You've got to be obedient to get the desired results. More specifically, we need to ask ourselves, has obedience to God paid off in your life? And if so, when? Maybe you haven't seen the payoff yet. Maybe the payoff is not going to come until the end of your days. Which takes us to today's scripture. If you'd like to read along with me, we're going to take a look at chapter 23, verses 1 through 8. And in my Bible, chapter 23 is titled, Joshua's Farewell to the Leaders. After a long time had passed, and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua by then was a very old man. And he summoned all of Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am very old. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain, the nations that I conquered. Between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the west, the Lord your God himself will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you and, he will take pos and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. Here's that phrase again we've heard every week. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. Those are God's word in the Bible. God's word for the people of God. Joshua never once gave up in his zeal for obedience to God, and he hammered it home constantly to the Israelites. And even as his life neared the end, as the scripture tells us, he had grown very old. His time was coming. His focus still remained steady. Joshua then becomes a great example to us that sometimes we give up too easily or too soon. I'm getting to the age where I have more aches and pains sometimes. And we were with the family on Friday our family and there's lots of young people and they can do young people things that I can't do anymore they were sitting on the floor cross-legged like an Indian and I was like oh I can remember doing that and even going from that position and standing up without using my hands heck I can't get up on my hands and knees from that position now lots of things change that is exactly it but obedience to God never changes. It is a lifelong commitment. But this thing that we call life often distracts us, doesn't it? It often pulls our focus towards other things that God wouldn't have us be focused on. And Joshua's poignant reminders there in chapter 23 where I just read remain as reminders to us even today. It, that is timeless advice. Hold strong to God. Obey God. Pay attention. And love him the way that he loves you. 
First of all, if you noticed in that scripture, Joshua called together a whole bunch of people, trusted leaders and elders all together so that everyone got the same message at the same time. You ever have that problem in your family? You tell somebody something and you think, okay, the word's going to spread, and then it comes back to you and it's like, huh? Is that even what I said or asked to be spread about? So Joshua was wise. He called all of the trusted leaders together and everybody got the same word at the same time, no mistaking what was said. He knew their weak spots. He knew his weak spots. The question is, do you know yours? That's a serious question. Do you know your weak spots? Where are your weaknesses? Where are your strengths? But today we're going to focus on those weaknesses. Joshua knew where those weak spots were and where the Israelites were most likely to slip. And he gave them reminders in this little piece of scripture about how to live a life that was pleasing to God. First of all, he said, follow the book of the law, the Ten Commandments. Now, when you read the Ten Commandments, are there really any questions about what you're supposed to do or not supposed to do? Are you awake at all? When you read the Ten Commandments, are there really any questions about what you're supposed to do or not to do? Pretty clear, right? So Joshua said, first of all, hang your hat on those and live by those Ten Commandments those books of Moses. And then he said, don't worship any other gods. Don't do it. Throughout the chapters that we didn't read through there, the people tended to want to fall back to their old ways of sacrifice and building an altar and worshiping and all that. And Joshua's like, no, no. God said don't do that anymore. Don't do it. So you don't worship any other gods. And then he said in Pastor Donna's words, not Joshua's, but I could understand these words, he basically said, watch out for temptations right in your backyard. Uh Uh-oh. Now most of you know I like pie. Living proof that I like pie. Doug made homemade pumpkin pies for Thanksgiving. Thanks, Doug. (laughs) It's a huge temptation. I took one bite off of one little corner. It was wonderful, by the way. Didn't eat the whole thing, but temptations come in all kinds of ways, right? If y'all just survived Thanksgiving and you're here today, you know that that temptation of those tables laden with food and now the leftovers, which are my favorite part, oh, yum. It's a temptation that's there. Temptations right in your own backyard. Another thing that can be difficult are our relationships and associations. Those can be some of our most difficult temptations be careful little eyes what you see be careful little ears what you hear be careful little hands what you do you might remember the children's song very well part of our godly obedience and our effort to be obedient to God is identifying our own weak spots. If we know where we're weak, then we can do our best to avoid the temptation. And when we identify those weak spots, that helps us to set this, to, to avoid this stage that is set for disaster. When we develop strategies to overcome temptations, we realize that that is critical to being obedient. You know, it's like a little kid and a fire, and kids are fascinated by fire, aren't they? 
And usually the only way, no matter how many times you tell them not to mess with the fire, is somehow they have to get burned, and hopefully it's in a minor way. Any of you little boys ever play with matches? John, I'm looking at you. No. Long. Well, and there you go. Oh, boy. All kinds of examples of temptations that are out there that sometimes we just got to stick our hand in the fire and try unless we have a strategy for overcoming them. How would the outcome have been different if Joshua had not have been so obedient to God? How do you think it would have all worked out if when Moses died and God chose Joshua to take over and Joshua said, yeah, well, God, that's a great plan, but I have a better idea. Hmm. It's happened in the Bible before, but not with Joshua. His leadership, his brilliant military strategies were nothing without God as his partner. Do you think for one minute he could have gone into Jericho? What we decide the walls were 20 foot thick and 25 foot high? And one brick block and stone at a time, it came tumbling down. Why? Not because the army was so mighty, but because God was leading the army. Joshua was a living example of holding fast to your Lord and God, as we heard in Scripture in earlier weeks. And because of that, he, he created this incredible legacy that we talk about today that has its whole own entire book in the Bible. So, how do you want to be remembered? When you look at Joshua, do you think of anything negative? I don't. In all the studying and I've reading and reading that I've done in the last month, plus I was in a Bible study earlier that really delved deep into Joshua, I couldn't find one thing negative about him. He was a man of God and he stuck with it even when it made no sense at all. Is that how you want to be remembered? as a person who stuck with God even when it didn't make sense to the whole rest of the world. What legacy do you want to leave behind for your family, for your associates, for your church, for those that you have influence in your life? What legacy do you want to leave? Do you want it to be a legacy of being lukewarm? Or do you want it to be a legacy of being red hot for God? I'm going to give you a warning that you probably don't need already, but I can, so I'm going to, and that is to beware of making your own way without consulting God along the way. Because guess what? The world is going to quickly consume you, period. The world is waiting out there to quickly consume you and your beliefs. You see, we aren't meant to do this life alone, and it's proven by the fact that we're here. We could all sit at home and listen to televangelists and read our Bibles or whatever, and we get fed that way, but the fellowship and the Bible addresses it over and over and over again. There's accountability. There's support in fellowship, and this is what it's all about, the fellowship of like-minded people who are trying to follow God just like you and I. We know we don't have it right. In fact, we know we'll never get it right, but we know we have the opportunity to get better because of the fellowship that we share. But it's so easy to slip into quiet rebellion, amen? Amen. It is so easy to slip into quiet rebellion, picking and choosing what course you're going to follow and whom you will obey. The way that we live our lives, my friends, demonstrates to others our commitment to serving God. And so the question begs to be asked, what is your life saying to others? 
Are you demonstrating thankfulness for the opportunity to be obedient to God? Now think about that for a minute. Are you demonstrating thankfulness for the opportunity to be obedient to God? When God calls you to do something that doesn't make sense and the rest of the world is coming down on you and saying, why are you doing that? Why would you do that? Da, 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 da. But God is calling you to it. Are you demonstrating thankfulness for God's call in that area? Because that makes all the difference in who you're influencing in your circle. And it really comes down to this. It's a matter of choice. You know, he, remember that he loved us enough to give us free will and choice. And boy, do we use that. Sometimes for good and sometimes for not. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. And if you choose to be controlled by God's spirit, reaffirming it daily, you're going to find your payoff to your obedience. Your life here on earth will still have challenges, sometimes challenges beyond belief. But we aren't living for the here and for today, are we? We're living for our tomorrow. So let's do this. Let's focus on what God's will is for our lives. Let's just simply focus on that. For our lives, for our family lives, for our church lives, that is going to set us up for obedience to him and certainly for an eternal payoff. We had a little family gathering the other day and we were talking about just family in general and the family dynamics. And a couple of the younger ones said to Mike and I that they said, you set a really high standard that's almost unattainable. And I said, Isn't that what grandparents are supposed to do? Godly grandparents are supposed to set the bar high. Because if you come anywhere even close to it, we're thanking God for that. Thanking God for that. So in this season of Thanksgiving, I give you that beautiful word again, Selah. Selah, which means pause, which means reflect, and which means praise God. Pause, reflect, and praise God for all that he is and for all that he will be forever and ever in our lives. Let's pray. Father God, it can be a heavy message, but we simply need to think simply like Becky said and Use that stoplight analogy. Go when you say go. Slow down when you say slow down. And stop when you say stop, even when the temptation of the world is there. God, you are so amazing and you are so precious to us. And we know that we are your precious children and we know that we disappoint you on a regular basis. But you hang in there with us because you love us that much. Help us to understand the need for obedience, especially to your word. When we discipline ourselves and follow what you have in store for us, great things are there. This life may be filled full of frauds and struggles, but Lord, eternity is forever with you. We pray it in your name. Amen. Let's stand together for our closing number.